welcome to Cats and Rats Podcast, covering your Florida Panthers. Hey everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Cats and Rats Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Kirby Lupel, alongside my co-host, Nick Levine and Cody Stevens. It's a little cold right now up here north of the border, so I'm trying to stay warm, but the Panthers are hot on the ice right now. They've won seven of their last eight. They've become road warriors over this recent stretch here. And as well, really good special teams-wise, power play, penalty kill. And now the schedule starts to favor the Panthers. All these games in the Eastern time zone, they don't leave the Eastern time zone until I think the next game maybe in March against Dallas. Um, A lot of home games, be it against divisional opponents or Eastern Conference opponents. And the Panthers are starting to roll here again. So, uh, Nick, what have you thought about this recent stretch from our Florida Panthers here? Um, it's been really impressive. Uh, I think that the biggest emphasis in this eight game, um, the, in this recent stretch that you just mentioned was re- at all facets of the game are clicking right now. Power play, penalty kill, five on five. Um, I had a little bit of a concern with the five on five scoring, but um, I'm not too concerned about that heading into the future because we're generating a ton of chances five on five power play has been unbelievable since December 23rd. We're second in the NHL in the power play, the penalty kill outside of that um, one off against Minnesota um, Mm -hmm. really been very consistent. It's been very strong Uh, coming out of the all-star break had that little hiccup against Philly. But other than that, the Panthers have been playing really strong. Bob's been spectacular and, uh, I've been really pleased with our play and hopefully we can continue it going forward. And Cody yourself. I mean, this stretch from Florida has been extremely impressive. I mean, defeating some really uh, tough teams, Colorado being one. Uh, Like I said, as Nick said, I mean, everything's clicking right now for Florida. I mean, that hiccup against Philly was not the greatest of games, but once again, they've proven that they can bounce back from these and have won uh, three straight since then. I mean, going uh, beating a desperate Washington team, trying to stay in the playoff hunt. I mean, going into, I mean, just dominating a Colorado team who's everyone is a consensus Stanley Cup contender and then just walking into Pittsburgh and just dummying them. And it, I mean, that game was no contest. I mean, if Florida just continues to be one of the best teams in the NHL, if not the hottest team right now, if outside of maybe the Edmonton Oilers, but everything's going well for them right now. Yeah. And like you guys both said, I think, you know, if you look at this team individually, you know, or even collectively as a unit, as you know, Paul Maurice often comments on, I think that's a change from Paul Maurice from his time in Winnipeg used to hear a lot of his press conferences and him talk about Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler. And it wasn't as much as him standing up for the leaders in the room. I think it was him fighting the Canadian media and protecting, you know, his star players. And that's one element that he doesn't have to do with Florida. And the way that Alexander Barkov brings his game, game in and game out, the way that Matthew Kachuk is now producing, especially on the score sheet, but even some nights playing really solid uh, fundamental defensive style game as a winger. Um, he's not have to stand up for those guys in the room and, and the way that Bobrovsky has been playing net here, you know, the NHL, you know, star of the week and 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 just different accolades that he's got here as an all-star of late um, in this first half of the season. It's just everything's going well. Um, we talk about on our post-game Twitter X spaces, not to get nervous about this team. It's such a relaxing viewing experience for me as a lifelong Panther fan that has seen everything. Um, every gamut of emotion and this team just kind of breathes that relaxed feel into me. And it started with me last year in the playoffs guys, as we went along in that Boston series, and especially as we went into that Toronto series and we scored that early game one goal that just really settled my kind of temperament emotions on this team and, and just guys that are able to come through in big time moments and how the national media, be it in, in the States in Canada is talking about us and saying, this is a team that is must watch TV and is appointment television. And it's just so humbling, honoring, honoring to be a feel like this team is ours and everyone else 
has those feelings about us, you know, and there's fans in our fan base, you know, that we go out with and stuff like that. You're always going to do that with your own fans, you know, on an off night, like we saw against the Philadelphia Flyers there, but that's fans in the motion in the moment after losses. And uh, this team's really putting it together right now, but let's transition guys into our main segment here in episode two. Uh, Something that I put a little thought into, and we've talked about over the last week or two here, it's make your case for series. So this is series number one. And if you're following the Panthers closely at all, you realize that Bill Zito has a hard job ahead of him here. Which players will come back? Which players won't? If you guys could see my DMs on a daily basis, every morning, every week, people hitting me up. Kirby, are we bringing this player back? Are we bringing that player back? Do we have room for this guy if we let this guy walk? There's no way that Zito can bring all of these players back. And I get these questions all the time. I want to bring it to the podcast here. I want you guys, you listeners as a community, interacting with us on this, talking about this when we tweet this out, when we share this on Instagram. Again, our new account on Instagram, Cats and Rats Podcast. Make sure to drop us a follow there. And we'll have a lot of like group interaction. So make sure to make your comments publicly. I know some of you are a little shyer and will message me you know, privately, but we want to see that interaction publicly. That's uh, It's just a good talking point leading up to the trade deadline, leading up to July 1st this summer, and kind of what Zito's got ahead of him here. But let's start with this season right now. We'll get to some other names in future podcast episodes, but we're going to start for making the case for Gustav Forsling that Cody has tonight. Um, Sam Reinhardt that Nick has, and I have Brandon Money Monter. Now, I said we can draw names out of the hat. Cody doesn't need to have Ekblad. I don't need to have my guy Monter, but you know, this is kind of how we went along with series one here. We kind of came to an agreement here. They also said to me, Kirby, you might have the hardest case to make here. So we'll save that for last, but we'll start off first with Cody with Gustav Forsling. Make the case for him. Yep. As long as we understand Nick has the easiest case to make. Yeah, but that's kind of built in. Don't right? don't even need notes for that case, but <laughs> but we agree Gust- on that. We all agree on that part. I mean, yes, yeah, no, no. But for Gustav Forsling, I mean, a fan favorite, I must say, because of the story, basic of how he came to be a Florida Panther, was a waiver wire pickup from the Carolina Hurricanes, uh, back in 2021, but. A little bit back on for him. If he was drafted in 2014, a fifth round pick out of Link Lincoln Ping, Sweden of the Van, and was selected 126 overall by the Vancouver Canucks. Since then, has uh, it was traded from Vancouver. Started his career in Chicago, then uh, ended up in Carolina. Then and got bounced around the minors. Ended up in the Carolina system, and then. Ended up on waivers and ended up here in Florida, and he has blossomed here ever since. Steve Goldstein always lets everyone know that he's a waiver wire gem. Just wanted to add that. I mean, I think he's the reason why so many people had so much hope for Josh Bahura, but I guess mm-hmm. we have to remember waiver wires only happen once in a blue moon when they turn out like this. But mm-hmm. case for Forsling, number one, he his availability. Gustav Forsling, ever since he has joined the Florida Panthers, has been nothing short of, I guess you can almost call him an Iron Man. I mean, in the, I believe it was in the 56 game season, he played 43 games, which was the most games he's missed. And he's only improved since then. 71 games played in the President's Trophy year, only 11 games missed. Then didn't miss a game last year, has not missed a game has missed one game this year, but that was due to paternity leave. So mm-hmm. no injury there. Uh, it is very, ex- it's extremely hard to find guys who are this, uh, should durable? I say? Durable, yeah. And especially in this kind of system where the defensemen are asked to be more physical, always finish your checks, always be working yeah. along the boards. It is an extremely hard thing. I mean, uh, I mean, you saw at the beginning of the year, Montour and Ekblad missing time, and Forling has stepped up this year in their place, uh, five on five to kind of help even out that production that we missed. And I mean, that's I mean, it's a strong first case. I mean, you can't look your your best ability is availability. You cannot go wrong with that. And only with you there. Yep. Uh, the second case that I have, and we talk, we constantly talk about this uh, amongst our Twitter X spaces, 
is he is the closest thing we have to the Mackenzie Weger replacement. And what I mean This by- is interesting, Cody, because some people loved Weger. Some people had enough of him at the end. I was always somewhere in the middle battling with both sides of the Weger yes. camp. So I like to see where you're going to go here with Gustav Forzen when you say that. Yes. Yeah, so when I mean by the closest thing to a Weger replacement, let's see. What was Weger good at when he was here in Florida? When he was by far the best defender. Mm-hmm. Best defender in space. Penalty he kill- stabilized Aaron Ekblad yeah, defensively. St- kind of... Eki's best years were with Uyghur at his pair. Uh, some and I and a guy that could step up in a pinch. And Forsling has slowly but surely he's developed his defensive game. He's at the peak this year defensively, at least in his career with the Florida Panthers. I mean, he's been our best defenseman this year. I don't think that's really undisputed. Uh, and. It's just the way he's playing right now with the utmost of confidence and then just being able to break up plays and sometimes create off on in the O zone. He's starting to gain a little bit more confidence in the offensive zone. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would like to see he's not spraying. He's not spraying yeah. and praying, which I used to always criticize him last year. He throws the puck on net with no creativity, uh, no uh, basis for time and space, especially time. I also he always think... thought guys were closing in on him, Nick, right? And right. now he's being a little bit more creative with the puck and patient with the puck. Go ahead, Nick. I also think he's a lot more physically engaged this year than he was last year. Um, I can go through there. Yep. I think particularly in front of the net, um, the way he boxes out opponents, right? Like, I'll say this, Aaron Ekblad, his partner, not the best skater, right? I think having him next to him, like they've just been unbelievable this year. I also think from a chemistry standpoint that – I don't necessarily think that the Ekblad Forsling pairing was very good last year. It was this year. It has been. <laughs> let's let's be real here. The, it the, wasn't. The, it wasn't. It was. That's another, and we were uh, critical of it as hosts, co-hosts, but our speakers. I think at this point they kind of built some chemistry with one another, and Gustav Forsling is playing absolutely outstanding this year, and particularly. And and the weird thing is, I thought if he was going to play this well, it'd be that first two months when Montour and Ekblad were out. I don't. I didn't really. I thought OEL oh, yeah, was the better player on that pair. Really, I'm with you there. I'm with you there on, on that. Um, for that first two months, but ever since Ekblad came back, Forsling has been terrific, and um, I think they should make it a point to keep them because, you know, they're not necessarily saying oh they're better defensemen here or there, but it's a guy you have. It's a legit guy who could play tough minutes, who is having an outstanding year. He could continue to play that way. Um. Now, Nick, you were alluding to numbers. We'll wait till the end of each segment, right. then we'll give our numbers or years or term yeah. that you know the fan base wants to hear from. Yeah, obviously, all depending on that, and that's what I'm waiting for. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But my last, my last uh, case here, or my last piece of evidence here is Gustav Forsling is by far the best defender on this team when it when it comes to defending in space. And what I mean by that is. Like off off the rush, when he's kind of by himself or on an island, Gustav Forsling is at his best. But how many times this season have you seen him break up odd man rushes due to his due to an active stick? It's been numerous times, and, and he's been in better spacing situations, Cody. Yes. Which you and I said, why is he lost along the boards? Why is he so far away from the boards? His spacing last year was very suspect, to say the least, and we haven't seen those as issues this year. He's really improved upon that. Yes, and I could, and for those of you who are kind of new to hockey or really learning the intricacies of it, spacing as a defenseman is one of the more important things that you need, especially in this day and age with this kind of speed. And Forsling, with being a top three skater on this team, he could keep up with anyone. But the thing about him is he's judging his space very well. He's keep he's in the better he's in better positions to break up plays. He's in better spots to maybe support his defense partners or his forwards when they kind of miss an assignment. Like he's been better in the, those aspects th- these this year especially. Where last year I think, like I said, we can all agree the first pair was not good last year. There was a big reason the air inconsistencies were a big reason why. We struggled throughout the regular season, and we barely made the playoffs last year. And 
it evened out during the playoffs, but I don't think at one point did the first pair ever in the playoffs become a threat. They they were just like out there, just they just kind of like disjointed, didn't play together, I yeah. think, you know, throughout the series. But know. now you could tell they're a threat together. Mm-hmm. And I find it very, very hard to think about breaking those two up. And now I know we're gonna get to the numbers here very soon, but Cody, are we gonna see a reflection moving forward of what we saw last year, which wasn't good at all, or what we're seeing this year, which you could say is borderline exceptional, I guess, is where I would put it. I mean, I believe Forsling has gotten better every year he's been with the Panthers, with the exception of last year. But I think he's the one number one thing he's learned how to do better is he's handled physicality 10 times better where I think in years Mm -hmm. past, he needed to have a guy on his pair to offset the physicality, which is why he succeeded in his first tenure with Florida with Brad Gogudis. But he also had a lesser role deployment and he was with a more physical defenseman than you could even say that he was, was and has been with, with Ekblad. So that's something to consider before. And I agree with you, Cody, and I don't Nick, you're going to jump in on this and Cody will get your numbers here, but does he continue this physical yeah. play, this spacing, smart awareness I, when the playoffs come? I, I did the one thing I do have a little bit of a concern with, as you mentioned, Kirby, was the fact last year uh, was not good. It wasn't. <laughs> and if you give this guy a long-term deal and he goes back to playing not even the way he was last year, but – I think the way he played, like, for example, the president's trophy, you're, that's not really going to cut it if he's if he if were if he's a at first it, pairing guy, if, if he's a per, first pairing guy. Now, obviously, he wasn't getting those the minutes and the um, line assignments then that he is now. But I do think that if Gustav Borsling is going to get a big payday, he's going to have to continue playing like this, similar to this. I'm not going to say. He has to be as good as it, but he has to be around this level because that that's, if we're going to invest long-term money into this guy, this is what we're going to be expecting. Oh, Cause this he's going to get, he's going to get extra dollars now and maybe an extra year or two, which Cody's yeah. going to give his prediction. Yeah. So go ahead, Cody. I'm interested I, on this right now. If I were to, to give this off for us, like I am at four or five years, you give or take, but I'm at oh. between 5.5 like I'm at about five point two to five point seven in that range right now. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and again, just... we're doing these predictions after the All Star break. People listening back to this, this yep. is after the All Star break. You know, a full just... half, half season under our belt. Here. Yep. And just to give you some names of some guys that are in that pay scale, Shea Theodore is at five point two. Eric Trenex also at five point two. Brady Shea five point two five. Jacob Slavin, That's a good one. Five point three. Adam Pellick, 5.75. I SM heard Le- from the Islander fans, Pellick's game's falling off a bit, but go ahead. That could be due to the fact that they're overplaying him, but hey, mm-hmm. who am I? Mm-hmm. Uh, Esselindel, 5.8. Neil Pionk, 5.87. That's a good one. And then Different style of play. Pionk's more of a physical guy, but their deployment can be similar at times. But Brady Shea, I think, is a really good comp to Forsling. I, he's a bigger, he's yes. a bigger guy, but I think they play similarly. Where I think with Shea being bigger, I don't think he's as physical. Like, but I think that is probably around where I would give Forsling. Like, I understand he's having a great year, but once we get past those names, we start hitting. Like and I and some of these guys signed extensions since then, but this is the number they're at. Ross was yeah. Darlene at six mil. Then you get to Ryan Pollock at for the Islanders at six point one. Josh Morrissey at six point two five. Travis Sandheim at the same cap hit six point two five. Our old friend Mackenzie Weger at six point two five. Huh. Then Hampus Lindholm at six point five. Then I'll end that at Ryan McDonough at six point seven five. Yeah, where... a bunch of those guys are ahead of Forsling when it comes yeah. to me. You know, yes, for and, various reasons. Larger yeah. sample size, better hockey players have done it for a longer time. I, what what I, have you? Yeah, and I believe if you start getting into that six mil range, I believe you're yeah. kind of you've lost the plot. You're kind of inching away from where I think he needs to be. Yeah. But yeah, Gustav. Um, like um, me. 
I'm surprised there, Nick. I'll be quick on those numbers there. Um, but yeah, I, if I, if we could get him anywhere from five two to five five, sign me up now. I've been critical of Gustav Forsling's play, um, especially last year. But the season that he's having, five point two to five point five, is very reasonable for the four or five years I believe that Cody stated. If it starts to inch up towards five seven five six million six by six, I'm personally out at that. Um, or I'm really like struggling to figure out what is Zito's direction here when the fan base says, oh, we can get Reinhardt on a sweetheart deal because there's no state income tax, which Nick will get later to in his segment. So when we start to get to those numbers, guys, I'm kind of out and I'm on the record on my old podcast on spaces. When Mackenzie Weger was looking at that six and a half, seven mil number by six on the open market, which he never ultimately got to when he got traded to Calgary, I was out on anything really above six by six because, uh, as again, the defenseman I'm going to talk about is around the same age as Mackenzie Weger. And I was worried about age on the end of that back end deal and kind of how Weger kind of disappointed us for two straight playoffs and, and you know, critical mistakes at critical times. So, again, I want to see what Gustav does in the playoffs. And then I can evaluate more from there. But I think Cody's very reasonable on that number. Nick, what's your number there? For me, I'm around what Cody's at. I set my absolute max on it. Like you said, getting to that $6 million range is kind of pushing it for me a little bit. I would say around the anywhere from 5 to like 5.75 for me would be I'm okay with anything past that. I'm like, okay, kind of could have maybe gotten an upgrade if you're going to pay him that much so that's much as my thought process behind it cody anything on uh wrapping up there on gustav forsling well, nothing, we transition to Nick? nothing that comes to mind there but like i said he's having an amazing season it's just i think if you put him around those guys that i just mentioned i don't think it's that bad of a deal either way like i said he's getting more than double his salary he's only making 2.66 right now so like it's getting the pay raise and I don't see Zito going past four years due to his past contracts, but you'll see. Um, Before we get to Nick and him making the case for Sam Reinhardt, I just want to let everyone know and our listeners, our sponsor Canesware Panthers fever is here. Are you geared up? Canesware in Davie is the place for all of your Florida Panther needs. They have the latest gear, for our favorite NHL team, jerseys, polos, t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. Caneswear has you covered. Stop by their store in Davy or pantherswear.com. Again, that's pantherswear, W-E-A-R.com for all your Panthers gear. So Cody just gave us his case for Gustav Fors, and we're going to go to Nick here right away, and he's going to make the case, and it's not going to be that hard to make the case like, like this uh, Cody guy and I mentioned. Freaking need one, man. <laughs> Cody and I love this guy. Listen, he's one of listen, our favorite don't Panthers. hate the player. Hate the Dog, he's got 40. Okay, We're not even so, like... uh, that ain't my fault. That ain't and my Nick, fault. In our pre-production meetings, Nick said, give me Reinhardt. I was like, oh, okay, Nick. All right. All right. No, well, no. anyway, you're getting I'll the short end of the stick next time. Uh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, um, I'll take it from here. Um, so yeah, I mean, Sam Reinhardt, we obviously know is having a terrific season. Um, this is a guy that, as many people know, is second overall pick, um, by Buffalo. Um, this is a really talented guy, and not that he was a bust in Buffalo, but he never really lived up to that full second overall potential. Then he came to Florida, and he has been terrific since coming to Florida. I just um, – a little bit of um, details about his current contract. He's in the final year of a three-year deal where he's making $6.5 million per year. Um, he has seven straight 20-goal seasons and already has 39 this year. He's got three straight 30-goal seasons all with the Panthers. Um, ever since joining the Panthers – He's over a point per game. He's got 213 points in 212 games. He actually leads the Panthers in goals since joining the team. Mm -hmm. And I remember a lot of conversation, right, on our uh, Twitter X spaces. And I really I heard the phrase a lot, well, I don't want to pay a guy that much for playing on the third line. Wink, well, wink. Sam Reinhart was third amongst forwards on the team 
last year in ice time. The only players who had more ice time than him was Barkov and Kachuk amongst forwards. It's not necessarily the notion that the, he's playing on the third line. Well, he's playing top six minutes, he's playing first line minutes. He's playing even strength, power play, penalty kill. And having him on that third line last year really helped even out the depth and just created matchup issues for other teams, which is so important. Um, My personal analysis on Reinhardt as a player, like I just said, he could play anywhere in the lineup. We've seen it since he got here. He had success with Lundell and Marchman, and then last year with Lundell and Osterinen, and now with Barkov. Um, I, I just think that in terms of complete players, Reinhardt, it has been unbelievable playing. He's good on the power play. He's good on the penalty kill. Um, and the reason why I'm not overly concerned, and I'll get into his contract in a little bit, about giving him a long-term deal is we mentioned this on uh, previous conversations and the spaces, is that he's not a guy that really relies on speed and physicality. And um, Paul Maurice actually just came out with a quote today. He says, next to Ron Francis, he's the smartest player he's ever coached. Um, so having that hockey IQ is definitely something that is going to help Reinhardt as he ages and as he gets older. He's a guy, very complete player, as I just said. He's a part of the core. He's it's Barkov, Kachuk, Reinhardt. He's a guy that's part of the core, and he plays the way the Panthers like to and want to play. Um, uh. No. I will say this, if Reinhardt does stay in Florida, which he has communicated to the media that he wants to stay, um, I don't personally believe or think he should get more than will or should get more than Kachuk or Barkov. A lot of people like to talk about uh, the no state income tax and everything, but I think an advantage here that Florida has that most teams really do not is that extra year. Florida, because they he's already on their team he's under contract for them and they're going to be resigned though they have his rights um he has they have the option to give him that eighth year whereas if he goes to free agency he's only going to get seven years so i think that's going to be a key part uh for florida coming into this where let's say he goes to another team state income tax or not gets you know nine and a half million gets seven years well he maybe, maybe he could take a little bit less and get that extra year get that eighth year so i think that's a component that's not really being talked about um too much um i just so want to get Co i just want to get cody in there cody anything there before we get to our like numbers and then nick's got a few more points i, I think there as well i mean none i mean he's saying everything i want to say the only thing i really want to say is for those of you listening do not let that ron francis <laughs> A uh, quote go over your head. He Rod France. If Sam Hunter becomes anything close to Rod Francis, any contract he signs is going to be a bargain. And again, I I just think hockey IQ, particularly for a guy who's older, um, who's getting older, is just going to benefit him more. And there's a couple players yep. that I want to compare him to. Not one for stylistic reasons, and another for contractual reasons. Um, so the stylistic. A player I want to compare Reinhardt to. They're probably a little bit different, but in terms of how they have aged is Joe Pavelski. Um, Joe Pavelski, we all know him as one of the best net front guys in the league in terms of deflections and everything. He is producing at a really high rate. He's on da uh on Dallas, the Dallas Stars. He's on their top line with Robertson and Henson. Pavelski has been absolutely outstanding for them. I think that's a similar trajectory that we could see with Reinhardt. Um, two really good power play guys. Yeah, Reinhardt two really good power play guys. Obviously, Reinhardt's uh, utilization on the power play is a little bit different than Pavelski's has been. But I think that, you know, similar players, very high IQ, um, good net front presence, um, not guys that typically over rely on speed and physicality, as I previously mm -hmm. had mentioned. I think that's a real seeing Joe Pavelski makes me a lot less worried about seeing a player like Sam Reinhardt. Now, for contract, I'm going to compare the contract reasons. People say, oh, I don't want to overpay him. I'd rather overpay the guy than lose him. So if I have to overpay him half a million to a million dollars, if I have to overpay him half a million to a million dollars, I'd rather do that than just lose the guy and have to replace his production, what he brings to the team and everything, because that's going to be very difficult. 
Um, what and that's I... something that's something that Cody and I would have said last year, Cody, and I'm sure Nick would have been on board with that at, at certain points as well. But yeah. yeah, like let's slightly overpay this player, right, to keep him, right. And I'll just go through his season by season real quick. Uh, his first season in Florida, he had 82 points in 78 games. The following season, last year, 22, 23, at 67 and 81. But the first 12 games of the year, Sam Reinhardt got off to an awful start. Uh, he had three points in his first 12 games last year, no goals. After that first 12 games, he really started to pick it up. He had 31 goals in 70 games after that, 64 points, 75-point pace. So we're talking about a guy, it's a 75, 85-point yeah. player and I mean, who can play uh, in all situations of the game. And I mean, Co- down, Co- year, down Cody year, might steal my point here. But go I ahead. mean, down year and he gives me 30, I mean, come on. Like, and, if and, he would have just and, gotten off yeah. to an average start the first 12 games, imagine when it, he probably would have, who knows what he would have had. And Nick, you said slow start last year. How about the first season? That's now the the fired Buffalo columnist Jerry Sullivan who came out and made fun of Sam Reinhardt. Well, that was in the first season, right? When he started yep. slow there and he picked up his pace. I want to add this point that I thought Cody was going to mention. 16 plus power play goals in yep. all three years with the Panthers and however he finishes his he's, third year at Florida is just going to blow those numbers he is out. Glad you mentioned that. He's actually second in the NHL over the last three years in power play goals. Oh, um, so. The only guy ahead of him is Chris Kreider, I believe. Um, oh, so, yeah. uh, and Chris Kreider had a down year last year, yeah, especially yeah, so, with the power but play. Kreider right. had a similar year to what Reinhardt's having a couple years ago. I don't think it's going to be as good because Kreider isn't really the all around complete player that Reinhardt is. But Kreider had what fifty a couple years ago? Or oh, excuse me, it's actually Kreider's numbers were ridiculous. Let me re- let me. Uh, that was over the last. Um, got that wrong. It's actually Leon Dreisaitl. Excuse me. That makes so more sense. That that's Leon Dreisaitl. So and he needs no introduction. Yeah. So the guy, only guy scoring more than him on the power play is Leon Dreisaitl. Yeah. He's ahead. Well, of yeah. Guys. If, you, if you've got Connor McDavid setting you up, I think a lot of guys would be there. So, Markoff might be there again. Kirby he's could be number of, one if he's yet. ahead. Of <laughs> I got good hands. Line. I got good hands. So forgive me for that. I uh, misspoke there, but you're not um, forgiven. Keep going. Um, but. <laughs> Ahead of guys, like he's got 10 more power play goals than David Posternock. Um, mm-hmm. he's got over like you just think of the guys that he's ahead of Posternock, Kreider, Zabanajad, Matthews, Stamkos. So it's pretty impressive what he has done. Now, the player I want to compare him to, um, for contract reasons is Mark Stone. Now, I know they're different players, right? Mark Stone has had some injuries, similar problems, roles, similar roles, similar types of like you know, very. Good deployment. Yep. Like... Um, I think that um, he, what Mark Stone has done over the last couple of years, I don't think anybody can understate how good he has been for Vegas, despite the injuries. Um, he makes nine and a half million dollars a year. Um, so he makes more than some of the guys. You might look around the league and see some of these other guys make a little bit less, but. If you take a look at where they are at in their contracts, how many years they have left, they're towards the end of those contracts. Um, for a majority of the guys that I'm referring to, or they when they signed those contracts, was kind of a little bit of a risk at the time, but also adjusting for the rising cap. But what I think Reinhardt should get, and realistically mm-hmm. will get, I'm willing to give him the eight years. Um mm-hmm. And I think anywhere from 8.8 to 9.25 million, because I don't think Kachuk makes nine and a half. Um, Barkov makes 10. Uh, and I think it may be fair if, even if Reinhardt got to 9.25, nine, even 8.8. Um, I think that's a fair number for him. Obviously the state income tax aside, that eighth year obviously helps with it. Uh, I just want to jump in quick there, Cody, then you go ahead. I'm totally, again, with you guys i was with cody uh, kind of on forcing which cody surprised me because i thought his number was going to be higher nick that's the number that i've used a lot with reinhardt and if everyone says bill zito can work his magic his magic at this point for reinhardt would probably be between 8.5 and 8.75 on either a seven or eight year deal like you mentioned so again whatever the term is for years give it to him if it's six seven eight yeah, and, and him, people care. saying oh give him five years so we can take him right to the end of his that's not how contracts no, work that's not how his um, agent's gonna that's, work that's, in the that's not how this is gonna work oh like yeah let's take five years and then once he's done with the five years he Look, might not and, be as good and, as he is anymore listen, that's not how this works and listen so, a player like reinhardt where, where his greatest asset is his brain mm-hmm 
the, you have no their primes last a lot longer than you think. And yeah, you ain't, you, you ain't gonna rake him over the coals uh, when it comes to contracts. When he's a smart guy, I'm pretty sure he has a smart team representing him. Yeah, and you want and you want to hear a funny stat with Nick's comp like Mark Stone. Mm-hmm. Mark Stone's career high in points in a season. And remember, Mark Stone's dealt with a lot of injuries, so it's probably not as high as it really should have be. But Mark Stone's career high in points is 64. Reinhardt currently has 64 points. Yeah, and that's just his double year with Florida was sixty-seven. And again, the first twelve games, he could not buy a goal. Like, listen, there were and, points last year at Spaces where people were like, "Damn, you're wanting to trade him." Yeah, like, again, I, I just think that mm-hmm. you, it, Boy, that and you can't thing. expect this as we close on Reinhardt. You can't expect <laughs> the season that he's putting up now. Again, Forsling, right. great year on his contract year. Reinhardt, great, great unbelievable year in his contract year my guy that i'm going to get into here a second not so much but you can't expect those numbers moving forward but like cody said the longevity is going to be there the one of the smartest players he's going to age like, like fine wine uh, uh cody you didn't give your number yet we're going to go to nick and then back to you cody i'm fine like nine plus just to 8. shade overnight 5. like i think he's going to get that yeah. he's going to get 8.5 to 9.2 for eight years i'm 100 percent on the eight years. that's yeah, a big and... range there cody what what are you going with more the eight five or the nine two side i'm nine, more at that nine two eight side. seven five that's where i'm okay. at you're kind yeah. of in the middle but you'll take more if the number's high if, again if you want if i'm at eight seven uh, five he goes i want i want, I want nine, a, two five i'm not gonna i want to like i want to yeah. take everybody no. to yeah. the season opener next year 20 was a 24-25 season? Yeah. Season opener of the 24-25 season. And instead of giving Sam Reinhart, imagine actually I'll say it like this. Imagine Sam Hart, Reinhart not being in the lineup. I don't like that. Uh exactly. Me so and Cody don't like that. Uh, do you do would you rather have to face have to be in a position where Sam Reinhart is no longer in your lineup at all, or you might overpay him a million, a million and a half if it were if it, it some comes fans to that. are with us, Nick. Some yeah. fans aren't. So again, like what you yes, you might overpay a little bit for him, but if you lose him, that's far worse than than overpaying him. Yeah. So and, I just we'll, we'll, we'll get into Reinhardt more in the summer because guys, we got we do have to move on. But like yeah. like his defensive awareness, yes. I don't think some of the fans that aren't high on Sam Ryer, and everyone is this season with the year he's putting up. But next year, let's see when those and I'll just say this. Get, I don't want to they don't see his defensive side. I don't want to compare him to this because it's not as good and Cody's not probably gonna love this, but you see what Mason Marshman's doing now. You're like kicking yourself, like, damn it, you know, like uh-huh. We could have really like that. Yourself. Uh-huh. Like, we could have really yep. like that. Really, that's a guy you just let away, and he's what is he on pace for 65, 70 points right now? Huh? Uh, again, it's just a guy. We already lost Marchment, and I think losing Reinhardt, I think that'd be a lot worse than that, losing. That, people thought that losing takes it to a different level. People yeah. thought losing Marchment was bad. People thought losing Gudis was bad. Just waited if we lose. People Sam got Reinhardt, on about losing about Giroux, it. who wanted to go home for money, and well, everyone said he wants to yeah. go win a cup. Well, he's not um, winning a cup. But unlike. Those Gudis and Marchment, we actually have the money to resign Reinhardt, exactly, which will hurt but, even more. Uh, Cody, uh, I think we we know what people were like after we lost those two players. If that's how, if you're, if we're missing them, if you're missing them, imagine how much you're going to be missing Sam Reinhardt. So I, I just think this is a no brainer. Think this should be number one out of all the three guys we're doing. This should be number one for Bill Zito. I think we're we're all in consensus on that. So, you know, yeah. so, yeah, so we save the best for last. <laughs> so anyone Inter- that hasn't heard interesting before, <laughs> way to put it, but go ahead. <laughs> that was with uh, a little sarcasm because I do is love Sam Reinhardt. This is going to become a gush fest. Get ready, Sam Reinhardt. Sam Reinhardt is part of the Kirby Ally squad, just like this man that I'm going to mention next here. So I, I love Sam Reinhardt. But this let's transition, the Captain. Cody's got to add in his all, all his little chirps. That's what he does to me in the post game, and everyone loves to do that in the post game when we bring up this gentleman's name. But here we go, Brandon, a money monitor. Shout out to my boy Dilo for that little nickname there. Uh, twenty nine years old. Everyone's trying to age him out. He's not thirty yet. He's not over thirty. He's twenty nine right now. You know what else he is, gentlemen? Right handed defenseman. Right handed defensemen don't grow on trees, and they do get paid. So. This is the point, in fact, that we could lose a guy like Monter because the market for a right-handed defenseman, whether it's a contending team or it's a bottom-dweller team, they're going to look at that. That's what Rako Gudis was 
a right-handed defensive plays a different style, obviously, than Brandon Montour. But w- Cody and I said Gudis was going to be very valued commodity on the market. And that's the thing that I do worry about if we lose Brandon Montour. But let's not get there. Let's pretend, you know, that he, he's staying with us. It's different scenarios here. I believe he's a secondary core piece. Not a core piece, but a secondary core piece. I have Barkov, Kachuk at the top. You've got Reinhardt right there. You've got Verhage there. And regardless of Monter's age, to me, he's a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth option moving forward with this team, but also especially guys in a win now window. If we were not in a win now window, I'd be a lot more apt to walk away from him. But like Nick said about Reinhardt, if it's a couple extra dollars here, an extra year on the end of the deal with Monter, even if it's got to be a buyout when he's 35, 36, I'm all for it. So again, he is approaching 500 games played. Players like Morgan Riley, who you admittedly better, drafted higher, higher pedigree. He's about to approach game 800. Victor Hedman, number one defenseman in Tampa. Again, not comparing him to him. He's over 1,000 games played, not to mention all the wear and tear on his body through a lot of playoff grinds. Brandon Montour, as you mentioned earlier, Nick, and Mesa Marchment, this guy has, has kind of taken off in the second part of his career where he was playing in floundering systems, in minor league, different things like that. Not as many games on his body. And what does Brandon Montour do well? He skates beautifully. And I think that's going to age. Franchise record defenseman in franchise history last year, 73 points, 16 goals, 57 assists. Um, Last year's playoffs, 21 games played, eight goals, five assists, 13 points. He had eight points in seven games played against the NHL's best uh, regular season team in in NHL history in the Boston Bruins. He scored five goals in that series, two in game seven. The first goal of the game and the game tying goal. You cannot bring in players to replace that and say, match that moment of Brandon Monter. Be a big game player. Be a big time money player. Now, Cody and Nick, you'll say small sample size. And I'm totally with you there. Slow start to this season. The offseason surgery. He hasn't come out like Forsling has and like Reiner and have on contract years. That might save us when we get to the contract numbers. You gentlemen talked about ice time. I am huge component on this. You can't plug and play someone for Brandon Monter. And this is one of my main emphasis here. And this is a two-year sample size, not only last year, but this year as well. He leads this team in ice time under Paul Maurice. Since Paul Maurice has become coach of the Florida Panthers, Brandon Monter is number one in ice time on a season that he had franchise record and a season this year where you can argue he's been underwhelming 24 minutes and eight seconds last uh last year this year he's at 23 plus so a little bit under where nick likes to see that deployment you know not as much minutes for guys that's going to wear them down so he's kind of under a minute from there but he's still getting all the pp1 quarterback time he's had that under both seasons with paul maurice paul maurice has unlocked him He talked about in training camp last year, I thought this guy wasn't working hard. And that's what some of the fans are critical of him this year. But Paul Maurice knows, I could throw this guy out there and he never gets tired. And he kind of realized that through the first training camp, which again, our former coach, Andrew Burnett, submarined him, didn't didn't see these abilities in him. And this is something that I spoke about like two seasons prior when Ekblad went down with an injury and Bruno gave him that initial bump but then he didn't follow that through even into the playoffs that year. And Brandon Montour was putting up points with uh, in that Washington series. But he was kind of um, underutilized and, you know, demoted. He had those different defensemen that Cody's talked about. So, again, the guy's currently making $3.5 million. That is a bargain. Everyone is talking about Brandon Montour this year like he's making $6, 7000000 million. He's not. He's still on his deal of $3.5 million. Now, we're going to have to look at what we're going to pay him. Reports have been out there, the 7x7. Seven seven. I've never been big on that number. Obviously, that number is going to probably drop from what he's doing right now. But to me, and people laugh, but he has young legs. I don't care about the age. He skates perfectly in today's NHL. He is the perfect defenseman for this era of NHL. And when you have a guy like Gustav Forzing, you're like, well, you know, we can lose a guy in Brandon Montour because we have Gustav that could skate well. You don't want to give that up. You want to keep guys that could skate well. You add pieces to that like Nico Mikola, who has really been good with Brandon Montour. And it would be a real shame with two guys that I like a lot in Brandon Montour and Mikola if we're just going to see this for one year and we're going to move on from Brandon Montour in the offseason. So again, today's NHL is all about skating. I think the ages thing is a new phenomenon. 
if you look at former players, Ray Bork, Dennis Podfin, and I'm not comparing to those guys, those guys had monster years at their 35, 36, 37, Nicholas Littstrom. But I want to use, guys, some comparables here, and I want you guys to jump in on this. I found 30-plus-year-old comps. Now, a couple guys at the top, the first few names, you might argue are better players than Brandon Monter, but also were paid more than Brandon Monter in that marketplace at the time, and I'm not saying that's what he should be paid in this. One that I found, Ryan Suter, he's the top comp. He's a left-handed defenseman, so he's not right-handed, so that drops him a little bit. He made $7.5 million on his 30-plus deal. He had five seasons at 40-plus points, guys, after the age of 30. So people that are like, well, Kirby, I think he might have one season, and then he's going to drop off. Ryan Suter had five seasons at 40-plus points after the age of 30. Yeah, but I don't mm-hmm. think – but Ryan Suter – That's my top comp. That's my top one. Yeah, that Ryan I don't think he, Suter was a no. lot more established at the time that he signed that deal. Because remember, at the time he signed that deal, I'm, I'm assuming you're picking the 13-year deal that he signed with Minnesota. Yeah, that's the that's the contract remember, there. And, at the, and that's at $7.5 million. I don't – Montour's not even going to touch that with inflation now, Coach. Yeah, I mean, but at the time, he was, like, one half of the best pairing in the NHL or one of the best pairings with him and Shea Weber. So, But, but again, I don't think we have a Ryan Suter at that level in yeah. our lineup. People but can, I think, can agree but, to disagree, but, but I'm think, just saying yeah, for eight. I just think Suter is a little bit more two-way than Montour is. But again, that's the top comp. I'm going to start to go lower. Guys like Justin Falk, Brian McCabe. Justin Falk. He's almost at 900 games played now, guys. Remember what I said with Monter? He's only approaching game 500. 47 points for Justin Falk at age 29, 50 points at age 30. You guys told me 45, 55 points. You would take that and run run with that with Monter. Brian How McCabe. Much does Falk yeah. make? 6.25. Yeah. Okay. So, again, a number I think that Monter will be below. But, and, I, and I will say this. I, I don't think the Justin Falk contract is currently or really has ever been a good contract either. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's but, another... But that is also kind of revisionist history there as well. Oh, um, yeah. Probably at his best, people were thinking of what they thought of Brian Monter last year. Brian McCabe, <laughs> his game really fell off at the end of Toronto. He came to Florida at 34 years old, 43-point season. He was playing, Nick's not going to like this, 23-20 of ice time. He was quarterbacking the power play. He wasn't in his prime at that point, but he still put up productive seasons on a, you know, average to fringe kind of playoff team with the Panthers who didn't end up ultimately getting over that hump into the playoffs. But I think they were right around that bubble. That's the year I think that they lost in a tiebreaker. Some other names, Vishnowski, 68-point season at 34 years old. He played 883 games in the NHL. Mark Streit, he started in the NHL at age 28, guys. He had six seasons at 40-plus points after the age of 30. Robert Svela, we're going way back in time, but for the OGs out there, 49-point season at age 31. He had a 45-point season at age 34 with the Leafs when people thought he was kind of all done. This is a name that I talked with Cody off the air, Cam Fowler. He's making $6.5 million. Again, I think Monter makes a little bit under that. 24-10 of ice time. 48-point season at the age of 31. This is a better comp for Brandon Monter. Tyson Berry, 55-point season at the age of 31. He also had 31 power play points in that season. And that's kind of where Monter is maybe over time becomes a little bit more of a specialist. But again, guys, with his skating, I think some of these guys he skates better than. Some of them, sure, they're better than him. They're going to make more money than him. But I think these are some comps to use. Tyson Berry's cap hit? Like four point something right now. Is that what okay. he's at right now? His contract before that was a little bit higher. But again, okay. I don't think Monter is getting four point something on the market. If you no, think I that, then either. that's disrespect. And I think he's going to walk and you're going to lose a good player. So I don't know if you guys want to jump in there. I've got a couple more points well, that I'll, I want to make. I'll say this. I'll let you make your um, prediction. Um, mm-hmm. And then I'll give my thoughts on it. Uh, I think... I'll just talk about Brandon Monto really as a player here. Um, he's an excellent skater. Like you said, he does have less games um, under his belt than a player his age normally would. Yep. But uh, the the issue I do have is, is he ever going to get back to any semblance of the form he was last year? Because what we've seen from Brandon Monto, he's been a good player. I'm not saying he's not a good player. Good player, right? But... I think what we've seen over the last couple of years, right, is like Brandon Montre, yeah, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Boom. Unbelievable. And then came back down to earth. So my question is, 
is last year the exception or is that the rule? Is that who Brandon Montour really is? That's where I get a little bit. Well, uh, I don't know. If he's what... a seventy-three point guy, Nick, then well, you're even any semblance of that, because if we're going to be pay- paying a guy, and I don't know what your number is exactly, but it's going to be probably, from what I heard, above five and a half million, based off the way you talked about him on yeah. the spaces. Would... Is this going to be a guy? Am I really going to be okay with giving him a power play specialist forty to forty-five points? Almost six million dollars. I don't know about that. I, I want to jump. In, I, I want to jump in there, Cody, before we get to contracts. But one percent WAR when he was traded to Florida, three percent EV defense, and I don't think it's been talked about enough how good defensively he's been this year. If you look at individual game score charts, he's been best defenseman numerous times this year. Not one off, not twice. He's been best defense metrics, and I don't think he's getting credit for that. And you could say, oh, he's playing with Mikola. Last year he was playing with Mark Stahl. Okay a 37, 38-year-old Mark Stahl. This year, he's got a competent partner. And Maurice, as much as he believes in Reinhardt, I feel the same about Monter. Look how he deploys them. Look who's on the ice at the end of games. I think those are key things to point out. Hey. But his defensive awareness and improvement is not being talked about enough. Hey, shout out Mark Stahl. He gave us good minutes last year. Uh, the Send I, all your uh, send all your DMs uh, comments to Cody on that one. I'll, hey, I'll fight that all day. Uh, the one thing... Like Montour, like to me, he's never hitting that seventy-three point thing again. Uh, like that year again, because one, I think it get it kind of gets lost in the cracks. We needed pretty much about sixty of those seventy-three points last year. Like those were huge points when our decor was at probably its worst. He was carrying the team, literally. Like, Like, and then. Who can forget his like the first round versus Boston? Or like what five, what four goals, four or five goals in that first round series? I got five goals, two in game seven, two in game seven, two in game two. I don't know where the other one was. Yep. Uh, I mean, he was a integral, like a huge part in us upsetting Boston. Uh, and it's just, I believe, um, it just comes down to like the AAV. Like I said, I don't think he's not hitting seventy three points ever again. It's not happening. And, and I and I agree with you. I, it's, I, I is don't that a bad that. thing? No, because he, he's it's just he's not that upper echelon tier defenseman, which isn't a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Like you don't like like necessarily you really don't need like your power play court to be like up like oh dude like sixty points like every year like seventy three points is damn near point per game if you play every game like. But the thing about me is like can't like I th- like a lot of the guys get this excuse, but I think Montour kind of needs it a little bit. I think Montour deserves the same excuse. Like he had off season surgery too. Like is he still battling back from that? Will he get back no. to that? Because his shot has not been as good as it was last year. Like he's been, as I like to say, destroying the plexiglass. I need to. Cody's see... a little critical on that, but he has been a little off, and his shooting percentage has got to come up a bit. I just need more better shots of like, 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 like. If you go back to the goal in the Pittsburgh game, like where Gadovich tipped it in, like I want more of that. Just on net, typical, not something aimed high glove and just smash the saw... plexiglass. Were you watching the Vegas game? The Kachuk redeflection in Vegas. There was one there against the Stanley Cup champ. So. Yeah, I think he shows up in those moments, but he has to be better in the second half, especially offensive production wise. But guys, let's get to our number here because we want to wrap with a couple things here um, on this podcast episode. My number, it's not changing too much. It's probably dropped a little because of this. So um, I think a six by six is fine, but uh, he might get below six with Zito, the no state income tax thing, but he could get more on the open market. I don't know if he's pushing on that seven by seven or six years by seven mil. I think that might not happen um, off of the sample size that you're looking at last year, this year, but easily 5.5. Anything below that, I think is very disrespectful. Um, but if Zito could get somewhere between 5.5, five, 5.75 five, 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 five on a five, six year deal. And even if you got a buyout that last year, I'm fine with that. We're in a win now window. So if everyone's like worried about the last year or two, your priorities are not focused on on the end goal here, which is the Stanley cup, which is icing the best team possible. You cannot find a guy on the market to plug and play what he's doing for this team. Power play quarterbacking, uh, the minutes that he's doing the middle pairing, you can't find that. I'm a bit different. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
he might be a little bit more valued because into Forsling because I believe like power play is a little bit more meaningful to a team now than penalty kills. But I six is pushing it for me once again. Yeah, I agree with Cody on that. I point. need more consistent play if I'm giving him six. Yeah. Like right now, I'm at five point three to five point eight for four years. Yeah. Once again, I'm at that. Where four are you closer to five? You're you're too big of marks. Five three or five eight? Where are you closer to? On the record. I guess I'm closer to five eight, but I'm not going above four years. I like that for me. Rules. I like that rules Zito's put in place. I'll, I'll do this right. I'll say this: five point two to five point six for me. I'd go five point five for five years, and would I be thrilled with it? No, but I wouldn't be throwing a fit over it. Um, five um, five kind of borderline that he maybe walks. Five point five for five years. Um, I think that's fair because um, I I just don't think you can. He, it limits the point like i'll ask you this question kirby what cap hit like if he had gotten re-signed this last summer what would he have gotten what do you think he should have gotten uh i was probably closer to the six two five six five range but that number's probably okay. dropped okay um, so, and, and maybe zito gets below that because of the, the and that's days. probably maybe what i think most people would have been yeah. at especially after last year people I that think weren't out on this year. Yeah. I think that this year, after the way he's played, I think five point five is a fair number. So he's um, lost. He's lost about seven hundred fifty thousand a million. Uh, yeah, and that's it's just yeah, it's just the, the way it is. Thing. The yeah. consistency. Because here's five, the thing: five five, right? you're starting to push. I, I, I think, and I know I have to take the adjustment and everything, but I think when you get to six, six and a half, seven, those are like legit top pairing number two defensemen. And I know Brandon Montour plays a lot, but he doesn't play necessarily in every. Uh, situation he's a lot of time on the power play he's a great puck moving defenseman he plays a lot of important minutes but in terms of penalty kill and maybe the final two minutes defending a lead that's where maybe that extra seven hundred fifty thousand to one million one and a half million would go if he had been a little bit better in those areas i still think he's a very good he's a good defenseman he's a great skater probably i i think the way he the, the way he skates i think he's our, especially last year was our best skating defenseman um and he was paired with our worst skating defenseman last year um Smart but i pairs. think um yeah so uh, i yep. think that five years i'd be okay with four four or five years around five three to five seven anywhere from that range i'd be okay, okay. with five yeah, you guys have a bit of a gap, and and I understand your guys' perspective too. And of course, I'm higher on the player as well. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of kind of wrapping up our make the case. We'll make sure to have more of these series guys before we go tonight. I'm going to briefly get this in. We'll sp we'll spend more time on this on future episodes. But uh, starting now through March 8th, if you follow me on Twitter X Spaces, myself and the community will share names that we're targeting in. The trade deadline, so guys, we're going to be very quick with this, but uh, one of my names that I've uh, written about, and I can send it to you out there, community, if you haven't read it yet, is Mike Hoffman, former Panther, specialist winger who can play on the power play one and inside the top nine. Hoffman's career high scoring years were 36 goals and 29, and power play scoring was at 17 goals and 11. Um, uh, Hoffman has been part of some of the bottom tier power plays since moving on from Florida in Montreal and San Jose, and I think you know, he's a guy that can bring those numbers up. Now, since I wrote that article on January 22nd, Panthers power play numbers have been going up, up, and up. So, and again, um, trying to find yeah, that guy on Kirby that third Twitter line. bump in the other direction, sweet. <laughs> so, um, again, a guy that, you know, at 34 years old would be strictly, I believe, a rental at this time, but has, uh, just like I mentioned with Brandon Monter, I think Mike Hoffman still got some good hockey left in him and uh, can be a potential trade target option. I, I know, guys, you're going to share some names as we go along here. Nick, do you have one very quickly here before we wrap? Um, yeah, so I know a lot of people are talking about the top nine forward, which I believe is the biggest need in this um, Here we go. trade deadline. But I am um, using this to promote my Nick Sealer propaganda. Um, the guy is really good physical um, third pairing defenseman, can play 16 and a half, 17 and a half minutes a night towards the top of the league and block shots. He's affordable. If Philly is willing to trade him, me, I think a second would be a little rich for Sealer. Maybe a third or a fourth I could see. But this is a guy that costs less than $800,000 cap hit. You could get for a third or fourth round pick. And 
it just improves your bottom pair. Why wouldn't you do it and then move Kulikov down to the seven? Just gives you extra depth, gives you a better bottom pair. And again, like I said, what Vegas did with the minute allocation last year, um, evenly more evenly distributing the minutes amongst their defensemen in the Stanley Cup final last year. That's kind of what I want to aim for. I think Sealer yep. on the yep. team would definitely help with that. Yep. Thank you, Nick. Um, and Cody, uh, we'll have some more names likely uh, next time. I know you're going to have one right up for me here. Yep. Uh, yep. But right next before year. we go, yep. one by one guy, Boone Jenner. Maybe a little pricier on the market, but cheaper, $3.75 million cap hit. Can pl- very versatile. Can play drop the line. And know Zito pretty well from because you know old Columbus guy, and I believe Boone Jenner could be a very good top nine forward for not even this year, but for next year. Yeah, that's an interesting proposition. What going forward um, with some of these names that are going to be strictly rentals versus maybe if Zito can lock someone in. But like we talked about, there's got to be money allocated to these names that we uh, talked about here tonight on Make the Case series. So uh, before we go here, I want to thank everyone in our community. Our first episode got rave reviews. Give us those five star. Um, thumbs up, uh, whether you're following us on Spotify, Apple, or on YouTube, Amazon Music as well. And you could follow us on Instagram at Cats and Rats Podcast. And obviously on the Twitter X brand that we always go live after every post game. But uh, I'd just like to thank um, uh, my co hosts here tonight, Cody and Nick. Um, and let's go, Panthers. Thanks, guys. Thanks.